KFSR at CMAC present the Central Valley Ledger, a public affairs program featuring stories from all over the Central Valley with Sevag Tediosian, 90.7 KFSR. Welcome to another edition of the Central Valley Ledger. We're back recording and we haven't made it to the studio yet. So as I record this, I'm in my office in the uh, west side of Fresno, California. And I'm talking today with somebody who I met in Fresno, but I met him uh, for lunch in Fresno. I met him before that, and I've heard of him before that uh, through his work and his advocacy of issues that I'm also uh close to my heart that I'm involved in with Armenian genocide recognition. Um, I want to start by introducing you, Dikran Hodanyan. Welcome to the program. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Salag. It's uh, I really appreciate this opportunity. So I follow you on Twitter, and I, I was looking at your posts, and I realized, you know what? This guy is in Armenia right now during COVID, during after the war and during the war. So you're right now, as we're talking, you're in Armenia somewhere? I'm in Yerevan right now, yes. I'm currently in Yerevan. So it's been a tough year this year for everybody. You know, uh, we've had to make rooms into offices and recording studios, but I don't think people realize what really is happening in some parts of the world, including Armenia. Massive war and it's got to be tough for the people. So before we get there, what what are you doing over there? So to begin with, obviously, just like you and many other Armenians around the world who have been advocating for so many of so many issues that are dear to the hearts of many Armenians, I was following the war nonstop when September 27, starting September 27, when Azerbaijan launched its attack against Armenia. And I was in the U.S. and I was I was honestly trying to give it my all and to do as much as I can abroad. Uh, and I wasn't sleeping just like many other Armenians, just constantly trying to follow and be up to date with everything going on due to the time difference. And I was trying to just disseminate news. I was trying to be up to date as much as I possibly could. And I was trying to see how I could help from abroad as much as, much as I possibly can. And about three weeks into the war, I honestly thought to myself, given the current situation, with my work and just how things are set up, I'd rather be on the ground in Armenia. And and, and given what my skill set is uh, pro and my past experiences with Armenia, and I've been here many times before, I used to live here in 2016, and given my contacts, I thought I could be a valuable asset in Armenia. So I decided to get a ticket for the, uh, for about three, four weeks into the war to kind of contribute my efforts to the war effort. So I got here in late October, and I've been working with a few different organizations, and then I've been assisting also with the PR front of things. This was more during the war. But mainly I've been here through with the Armenian Relief Society, uh, where I'm working with displaced families and, a lot, and, and pretty much a humanitarian project, uh, kind of uh, accommodating all these displaced individuals, people that no longer have homes in Artsakh, uh, and generally just the integration of these people into society here in Armenia, as well as just dealing with COVID too, because it's a very big deal here right now too, and the numbers in Armenia aren't necessarily the best. Uh, and in addition, and I'll end it with here before you have any additional questions, I've been helping document and kind of just uh, take down what I'm experiencing. I've already been to Artsakh twice since I've been here. Uh, so I've been trying to document as much as I can and just trying to uh, like notify and spread information as much information as i possibly can to the public uh, about what's going on about what has happened and about uh, what the current situation is in Artsakh. so before we talk about the on the ground in armenia just traveling in covid on an airplane and getting to a foreign country that must have been an interesting experience did you have to quarantine uh, so first of all, you have to wear a mask during your entire flight, which wow. I mean is not is not <laughs> is not a comfortable thing to do to begin with. Second, uh, when you're coming to Armenia from the U.S., you have two options: you either take the test immediately, wait for your result, and if it's negative, you're free to go about and uh, you're you can walk around and you don't have to quarantine. I took a test before I even left, by the way, just for the airlines as well, just to be on the plane, make sure everything is safe. Your other option, which I didn't want to do, is quarantine for two weeks 
instead of taking the test when you land in Armenia. I obviously decided to take the test here. I got a negative test and I was free to already get down to work. And that's pretty much what the process was. So you get there and you get to Yerevan, I presume. And then from Yerevan, you go to Artsakh. Now, was the war still going on when you went to Artsakh? So I was working on going to Artsakh when the war was still going on. But during the final days, the situation was actually very bad and dangerous that they had blocked the road to civilians. Uh, and through the work that I was trying to do with various journalists and, and just covering on the ground, the last few days, uh, I was not able to go during the war. Uh, and the deal already took place on November 9th, so I was not able to go during Artsakh during the war, unfortunately. So you go to the first time you go to Artsakh, and you said you've been there many times. Mm -hmm. I mean, is there? Do you see the presence of Russian peacekeepers? I mean, are are you noticing what we're hearing in the media? Very heavy, very heavy Russian presence. Seva. For example, the first time I went uh, was November fourteenth, and I planned on visiting the Dadivan Monastery because at the time the region that this monastery fell under was expected to be under Azerbaijani control on November fifteenth. Mm -hmm. So I plan. I made the effort to go November fourteenth. Uh, to go before they before we were no longer able to go to this area, uh, and I went and there was Russian troops already stationed at the church at the monastery, uh, who were there. Um, and there's two main roads to Artsakh that you generally go from Armenia. One of them being the way from the north that takes you through Vartanis and takes you to directly to Dadivank and the Karvaja region. Uh, this region is no longer under Armenian control. So when I went, it was. Uh, and then I, the second time I went was through the southern route, through Goris, and um, there was a lot more Russian presence during that time, and it was at a later date. So the Dadivank Monastery has been on social media a lot. It's been, you know, covered by uh, journalists from around the world. So is there's no is it now officially a part of Azerbaijan, and is there a priest there, or Armenian priest? So Der Hovanes, the Armenian priest, who I'm sure we've seen on social media many in many photos and images too, uh, claimed that he was going to stay there. Uh, and uh, so the Russian peacekeepers were basically kind of defending or keeping control of, uh, or they had a presence there, uh, and Dadivank was going to be, part, like Armenians or the Armenian priest was going to be allowed to stay at Dadivank, uh, but and the, with protection of the Russian peacekeepers. However, the areas all surrounding it, for the most part, fell under Azerbaijani control. What an interesting dynamic, what an interesting puzzle. You know, as you look at the new map of Gharabagh, you know, as an Armenian, you're disheartened because so much land, you know, was given back. But, you know, do you see, I want to let our audience know just exactly how bad the war was, because I know a lot of people, you know, have a lot of complaints and are upset about the process. And, you know, I don't want to take sides in the matter, but I want to make sure people understand that this war was pretty bad. I mean, we were getting hit with drones. We were getting hit with military uh, equipment from Turkey, which has a very top-notch military. Do you see evidence of the war as you're driving through these towns? Yes, yes, actually. So for one thing, when I drove through Dad when I drove to Dadivan, I actually drove through a lot of the villages that were uh, abandoned and were going to be given to uh, Azerbaijan. And a lot of these homes, people were taking them apart. They were taking pieces back to Yerevan, Armenia. Uh, they were burning down their homes because they don't want Azerbaijanis to live in their homes that they've been living in for so many years. Uh, I did notice smirches on the side of the road. I did see hit bridges. Uh, I saw many uh, remnants of the war uh, that are still there. They're currently not entirely cleaned up, uh, but they're in the process of renovation and repair. I mean, it's got to be dangerous, right? I know the war has ended, but the tension is high. And anytime you've got military presence that close, and anytime you've got the tension that high, there's got to be some danger. Is that going through your mind? Did you even care? The thing is, I've been to Artak many times, Sevag. And let's be real, Azerbaijan has been violating the ceasefire from the beginning. And personally, every time I've gone to Artsakh, I've always felt a little bit of a risk just traveling to Artsakh because 
of the lack of respect Azerbaijan has for the ceasefire and the line of contact. So I've always felt that danger was present. Obviously, this time post-war, there's so many things up in the air, even with the deal, because there's new developments taking place on a daily basis where we don't know which exact villages are going to be handed on which day. Things are changing. Uh, it, I, I must admit that I definitely felt a little bit more anxious this time around. But that feeling of nervousness and danger, I feel like, has always been present for anybody that's been traveling to the region. But you go because it's it's your land. It's as an Armenian, it's your ancestral land. It's a it's a beautiful place with beautiful people, and uh, it's it's a must uh, do when you go to Armenia uh, to travel to Artsakh as well. So there was a lot of people that were going to Armenia or had plans to go to Armenia this summer, our family included. But those plans changed. But as I'm looking at social media, I am noticing people like yourself and others in Armenia from foreign areas like the U.S., Europe. Are you seeing a lot of different uh, diverse Armenians from the diaspora head back during this time? Yeah, I'm actually not the only one. There's, And I've <laughs> done my best to keep in touch, uh, to have some form of communication, coordination, and just a partnership with a lot of these people. Because, for example, there's many doctors that are coming here for a week, two weeks, that are being stationed at these hospitals. There's psychologists that are coming and talking to these soldiers. There's people from various sectors and various professionals that are coming to contribute temporarily in a, in a few amount of weeks, however they can, in the recovery effort, during the war effort. And I feel like this is just going to be an ongoing and continuing thing for months to come right now. One of the things I, uh, you know, look, I like you and many others, I've been following the news. I feel like every time I turn on my phone, the first place I go to is the various websites to see, especially during the war, because, mm -hmm. you know, with war, things change so fast. And so one of the parts of me is disheartened. I'm disappointed. But the other side of me sees this as an opportunity to get people back interested in what was going on in Armenia and Artsakh. Do you feel that there's more, I don't want to say energy, and I don't want to sugarcoat it because it's a terrible time right now, but is there a silver lining at the end of this? Is there a light at the end of this tunnel? I hope so, Silva, because the war definitely um, brought a unification of many different efforts from so many different communities around the world in supporting Armenia. And in, in a way, it kind of woke up so many people that weren't necessarily as involved, weren't necessarily as interested in general, and it wasn't a big part of their life. But you could tell a lot of people right now are a lot more interested. They're willing to invest their time uh, and energy into supporting and contributing to development of Armenia and Artsakh right now. Because right now, more than ever, it, Armenia needs us. Artsakh needs us. And, and I hope... Uh, I know I I don't want to use the term silver lining too because it's a it's a very tough time tough, tough time and tough situation to put it, um, but we should be we should be awake like this 24/7 in my opinion and I hope moving forward that will be the attitude of every Armenian around the world. One of the reasons why I feel this way is no one ever thought that parts of Gharabakh and Shushi, which we're going to talk about next with you would be given back to Azerbaijan, or they would take it back. And so that kind of is a wake-up call in itself, because the map of Gharabagh, as you and I knew it three months ago, is not the same map of Gharabagh now. And that reality, I don't know if that's set in for people, that, hey, these places that were once Armenian, the Dadevank Monastery, where people got married, people baptized their children, the church in Shushi, where, you know, just as early as last year, there were groups of Armenians getting married. Married are no longer, no longer ours. I mean, it's it's real, correct? Like this is no joke. So I uh, on the second trip that I went to Artsakh, I specifically made an effort to visit the region of Karvaj, uh, Kashatal, which is a province that was going to be given to Azerbaijan on December first, and I was there between November twenty sixth to twenty eighth before I went to Stepanagad. And I drove, and there was a group of other people there from the uh, from other organizations that were three D scanning these churches too for wow. archival purposes. And I was there with them for some of these uh, trips. And 
we tried our best to visit as many churches as we possibly could. My The group I was with, because they were doing that too, but I personally just wanted, it was like a pilgrimage, because there's a lot of these old, old ancient Armenian churches in these villages in this province that are no longer under our control. And as you're driving through, you see these abandoned villages, you see these churches that are from 14th century, 17th century, and they've been there for hundreds and hundreds of years, all gone right now and not under our control. Well, do do you see Russian peace? Hopefully, Russian peacekeepers will protect these areas. And I know we're relying on the Russian peacekeepers and the Russian government, but let's be real. The one that the, the country there around Armenia that Armenia needs is are the Russians. It's close. I mean, look, as much as we in the U.S. want to support Armenia and Europe wants to support Armenia, Russia is just there at the back door. So are you seeing um, in these areas, especially with the churches, the smaller places, these peacekeepers? Uh, so the way to get to the area that I went to, Kashatal, uh, you basically enter, as soon as you pass the border using the southern road, you have to make a left through, left at a dirt road. And it's largely a dirt road that you just keep taking north. And to be honest, uh, <clears throat> the Russian presence was on the main road when I went. And when I went, um, <clears throat> these areas that apparently, so the Lachin area where Berzor is, I was told that on December 1st, five kilometers north and south are going to be Armenian, but beyond that are going to be Azerbaijani. So I'm not exactly sure how much of a Russian presence is going to be uh, stationed at the churches that I visited in Kashatal, just like how they were in Dadivank. I, I, it's very unclear, and they weren't there when I went like Dadivank. One of the pictures that I noticed you took is mm -hmm. going into Shushi, and there's now an Azerbaijani Shusha word sign up there where there was one in Armenian. So when you drove through it, it was technically Azerbaijani territory? Yeah, that was actually one of the most painful parts of the visit because you have to drive by it to get to Stepanagir. You don't drive through it, you drive by it and you take the road left to get to Stepanagir. And when you look to the right, you're just driving and you see the sign says Susa and like how Azerbaijani spell it. And then you see not only an Azerbaijani flag, but you see a Turkish flag, wow. which even more shows that this war was not just a war against Arme between Armenia and Azerbaijan. This was Armenia fighting a larger scale battle between a f multiple big powers, big resources, heavy artillery, and Syrian mercenaries on top of all of it, with a little bit of si well, a little bit uh, with silence of the international community that kind of added and only fueled to this war that we were fighting. On the ground, what are are you hearing about the Russian peacekeepers? I know in the U.S. there's this kind of group that say they don't want the Russian peacekeepers there. They don't believe Russia is an important ally. And then you've got another part that say, you know, the Russians are important. What are the people, the average people on the ground, are they thankful that Russian peacekeepers are there? So I've been hearing mixed things, and I've been talking to many people, and I, I don't want to say like, oh, this is an official sentence, obviously, and that, but this is just some of the sentiments that I've heard. Some people are very gracious that the Russians are there because they're protecting them from even more harm and danger. But others are also thinking, uh, for the last 26 years since the first war, I, I've been going traveling between Armenia and Artsakh without any issues, and now I need to go through Russian peacekeepers to get to my ancestral home. Uh, it's kind of an uneasy yeah. feeling for many when you feel like you need to get through another country's troops to visit your hometown. So there, those mixed sentiments are there and, uh, and definitely being talked about among many people. I noticed that you have a lot of, and you sent me some beautiful pictures, which we're showing as this interview goes, but you, I noticed you took a lot of pictures of churches Tell us a little bit about that. Was one of your goals to make sure that you document the churches and what they look like? It actually was. I was trying to document many of these churches that were going to be part of Azerbaijan on December 1st. So a lot of the churches that you see were in the villages called Merik, Hirik, and Hak, who were some of the oldest churches in the region, uh, because some of those areas have had very ancient uh, uh Christianity has had a presence there for many, many years in that in that region. So uh, I thought it was very important. I thought it was very critical for me to document these churches as, as many as I possibly could. And that's why I have a lot of pictures of churches, the inside of churches, the 
uh, cross stones outside of these churches. If there was any monuments that were outside, I, I made sure to try to take pictures as much as and document and write about and just learn about it as much as I possibly could in order to relay the information afterwards to the public. I want to ask you a question about why do this. So, you know, you when I met you, you spoke real well. You're obviously very educated. I mean, if you stayed in the U.S. and wanted to do like everybody else, check the box, have a career, have a job, have a family, you would make a killing right now. You'd make a lot of money. Um, I mean, you, you, you know, you're sharp, you speak sharp, you speak well, you're very polite. Why do this? Like you, uh, I mean, give up comfort in the U.S. and what many of us are doing in the U.S., and you decide in the middle of COVID, get on a plane, fly to Armenia in a battle zone. I mean, do you see the, like, the, the, what some people are saying, oh, why is he doing this? I mean, why do this? The thing is, the way I look at it, everyone has a role to play in this war. Everyone has a role to play in this battle. Some people, rightfully so, uh, work from abroad to help however they can through different grassroots efforts, through different organizational means, through different resources. And I, as, Somebody young who is not married yet and who uh, who was able to position my work in a way that allowed me to come felt like I had to take advantage of this opportunity. If it's not now, when is it going to be? Uh, and, and just like I said, everyone has a role to play. And I felt like during this time, especially the circumstances of my life and the fact that it can allow me to do so, I needed to take advantage of it. And I needed to be here and fulfill my part, my responsibility. Stepan Agert. A lot of people were afraid that Stepan Agert was going to go. Um, Shushi, as you know, overlooks Stepan Agert. So strategically, whoever has Shushi could control Stepan Agert. But the war was stopped. Stepan Agert is still in Armenia hands, correct? Yes. And life there, you videoed the market, you videoed other parts. Life there is continuing, it sounds like. Yes, actually. I personally witnessed a lot of busloads of uh, Artsakhsis travel back from Armenia to Artsakh in the last uh -huh. few weeks. When I was there, I noticed people going busloads back. Uh, and the day I went, especially, weeks had passed at this point since the deal. So uh, I noticed there was traffic, there was people walking in the streets. Uh, and generally, it seemed like life was beginning to go back towards normalcy, but it wasn't entirely there yet. Utilities, electricity, and Wi-Fi was not 100%, but it was present to a certain extent. Uh, the market, the main market, you could tell it had been hit. It was damaged. Some vendors were there. It was open. They were selling goods, uh -huh. but, but not all of them because they were damaged. Some of the parts were glasses shattered on the floor, buildings just dis, uh, destroyed. So it was not 100%, but you could tell strong efforts are being taken to uh, create the sense of normalcy and to try to bring life back to Stepan Aget how it was. And it's a very difficult thing to do nowadays, but there is definitely efforts being done. And you have some wonderful pictures, which we're showing, by the way. And so for our audience members who just tuned in, you're listening to the Central Valley Ledger. I'm interviewing Mr. Dikran Hodanyan, and he, uh, I met him in Fresno when he first came. We're still not back in the studio as evidence of my kids running around in the background of me, um, curious of what we're talking about. And so it's so interesting. COVID has changed the way we really operate. I mean, if you would have asked me that I'm going to do my show in, uh, in my room, my office on Skype, I would have said, why would I do that? I have a studio with all the high tech things, but we've made it work and you've made it work with what you're doing. So how long are you there? How much more time are you there? I've been here for about five weeks right now. And I plan on, to be honest, my return date is not just flexible, but uh, it was always subject to change from the beginning. I plan on coming for about a month in the beginning. Now I plan on staying here for one more month approximately uh, to help get the ball rolling on some projects that I'm working on, like I mentioned with the Armenian Relief Society. Um, and then I plan on coming back, but I definitely do see myself coming back very soon afterwards because there's so much more work to be done.
question for you, and this might not be something that you can answer, or the answer could be could take us hours to talk about. But there's a lot of people in our in America, Armenians predominantly, but others as well, that say, "How can we help Armenia? What can we do?" And the easy answer is send money, right? That's the answer everybody says. Oh, just send money, send them money. But what else? I mean, what other I heard that there were people that wanted to say, send some containers of clothing, but you know the containers get there three months' time, so it's not like you could deliver it and FedEx is going to deliver it right away, which could happen. But it's the costs outlay the outweigh the price of the goods being sold. So I mean, what can people like me, people like uh, others listening to this? do to help Armenians in the ground? Because let's be real, Armenian Americans have a footprint, not only in Fresno, in California, but in the United States. And as we talk, the one Moderna, one of the pharmacies that are putting together the COVID vaccine, one of the frontline ones is run by an Armenian American, Armenian Canadian. And so the footprint of Armenian Americans in this country is so great that Armenians and non-Armenians want to help. What could we do? So first off, I feel like there's, you're right about the container thing, because some people are trying to provide clothes for the winter, but if the clothes come after winter, then it's a little bit, uh, it's a little sticky situation. But first, I feel like there's, there's definitely work we can do back at home through different advocacy organizations like the Armenian National Committee of America, which some of it include having the U.S., uh, engage again in the current process as a part as a co-chair of the OSC Mint Group, which has been uh, dealing with the negotiations for many years. Another is there's a lot of issues right now with um, there's a lot of missing soldiers right now. There's a lot of prisoners of war, and the efforts on the Azerbaijani side are not really being transparent. They're not being 100% willing to cooperate, and there's a lot of assistance that or pushing that we need to do. Uh, for example, that we can do through the ANC, and that is hold the International Red Cross, for example, accountable uh, for all of these prisoners of war and uh, missing soldiers, because there's so many families that don't know where their uh, their Love relatives are. are. Yeah, exactly, and and they're just in constant worry. There's they haven't heard from them. Uh, they don't know if they've been uh, they've been pa- they passed away. Uh, they just don't know what the status is. And I'm sure you've seen so many videos Azerbaijani has pu- Azerbaijan has published of these horrific war crimes uh, that they also need to be held accountable for. There's so Proudly. many human rights. Yeah. And I, I don't mean to interrupt you, but one of the <laughs> things that I noticed about these videos of these war crimes, of these abuse of villagers and the, the soldiers is how proud they are. Like, there's no rule. They don't, they're not worried of any any rules of engagement. I mean... You know, I'm sure that the Armenian side has committed some as well, but not this this much, because I always hear, well, Armenians are doing it too. I doubt that it's this scale, and look at how proudly the Azerbaijani soldiers are beating these Armenian people. Given the xenophobic and Armenophobic rhetoric of Azerbaijan and Turkey and the governments that instill this within their people, it's evident in their behavior against the Armenians during this war. Uh, it's it's horrible. These videos that are being published with soldiers laughing, uh, beheading, executing, embarrassing, humiliating soldiers. It's extremely. Uh, it's, it violates all type of war crimes, and it's disheartening to see. And they need to be held accountable at all fronts. And from the U.S. as Armenian Americans, through our advocacy organizations, we can certainly use our government and our resources to hold. Of the international community accountable, and that's something we can do from abroad. But my second thing is, if you have the opportunity, I know it's dangerous, and you first have to take into account uh, COVID and all the safety measures that come with traveling, and that's very important to note down. But once you get past that, if you have an opportunity to come, even if it's for a week or two weeks, to contribute, given your professional uh, work or your skill set, I highly encourage anybody to do that. Because by doing that, you're helping through whatever skills you're able to, but you're also likely going to be spending money here, and you're going to be likely contributing to the economy in some way too. And if we do this in in large numbers, it will make an impact uh, through a period of time. Tikran, great talking to you. I mean, I, I just the pictures and the, and the Twitter. Where can we find you on Twitter? So my Twitter handle is d Khodanyan, 
Adi Khodanyan. Just my the first initial of my first name and my last name. Uh, and you can find all my updates. I keep posting pictures and just information that I feel like everyone should know about right now. Uh, and that's how you can find me. Well, before you head back to the United States, I definitely want to chat with you one more time to see what else, you know, talk about what else and maybe focus more on the humanitarian effort that's going on. But for now, thank you for your time. And, you know, I don't think people understand the risks that you took going there as an American, as an Armenian American. Um, but what you're doing is important. And on behalf of the community, thank you. I really appreciate it, Sevag, and I also appreciate you taking the time to interview me to shed more light on what's going on and making sure your viewers and your audience uh, learn about what's going on and are more aware and uh, so they know how they can also help and just contribute to whatever the help that's going on. KFSR and CMAC present the Central Valley Ledger every Sunday morning at 1130. For a complete program schedule, visit kfsr.org.